Let's just start, I'm a professor of economics at MIT, so let's start with a couple numbers. 5% uh, of GDP, that was healthcare in 1950. Smaller than what we spent on cars, smaller than what we spent on clothes. 17% uh, of GDP, that's what healthcare is today. 17 and a half, larger than what we spend on everything. 50%, that's what healthcare will be as a share of GDP in 2090, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Larger than we spend on everything else combined. Uh, healthcare is growing out of control, or is it? That's the big question we have to ask. The story I like to tell to my class about this is to compare health care received by the most important person in our country, the president, 100 years apart. In 1881, President James Garfield was shot. It was a fairly serious wound, although not life-threatening, until his doctors got a hold of him, probed him, widening the wound and infecting it. They call in, called in Alexander Graham Bell, who brought a metal detector to find the bullet, said he found it. The doctors went in, dug around, turned out he'd found the bed spring underneath the president and not the bullet, and they ended up killing him. 100 years later, 1981, President Ronald Reagan is shot with a very life-threatening bullet into his lung, and he's saved with an amazing modern surgery. Um, healthcare's gotten a lot better. Let's just look from 1950 to today. Okay, 1950 to today, healthcare's quadruples the share of our economy. Healthcare sucked in 1950. Okay, in 1950, babies born were four times as likely to die in their first year of life. If you had a heart attack, you were five times as likely to die within the first year. If you hurt your knee skiing, you're in the hospital for a week, you're on crutches for six weeks, and you're arthritis the rest of your life. Now we know you hurt your knee skiing, you get scoped, you're out in the slopes the next week. Healthcare is much better, and in fact, it's been worth it. That earlier question, healthcare has actually been worth the money we spend. The calculation that economists do, and the best reference for this is a book by David Cutler called Your Money or Your Life, which takes the calculations that economists do about the value of health improvements and compares that to how much more we spent on healthcare. It's been worth it. If you look at the improvement in life, that we've seen, we are much better off spending 17% of healthcare today than we would have been than we were spending 5% in 1950. That's fact one. Fact two is that we waste a huge amount of money on healthcare. We all know that. Now the fact we like to point to is the kind of Dartmouth Atlas facts, which compares areas across the country and shows that the less expensive areas spend on the order of a third less with no worse outcomes. Well, how are these two facts consistent? They're both facts. Okay, you've got the growth in healthcare spending being worth it. You've got waste of a third. The answer is the other two thirds been awesome. Okay, the other two thirds of healthcare has been so productive that it's carried the wasted one third. What that means is on average, healthcare spending has been worth it. And on the margin, we waste a lot of money. This was the problem that faced President Obama as we were drafting the Affordable Care Act. Controlling healthcare costs was, the, was really one of the motivating goals of the act along with ex expanding coverage. The problem was, it's really, really hard. We know lots of things to control healthcare costs. We know lots of ways to improve health. It's an incredibly small intersection, to come to John Fallon's comment, incredibly small intersection about things we know that both control healthcare costs and improve health, or at least don't worsen health. And so the Obama administration was a bit stuck in thinking about this and drafting the Affordable Care Act. They made promises about saving Americans money, but they didn't quite frankly know how. So what they did was try to move forward on four different pathways. And the first one's been mentioned a couple times, but it, as an economist, it's the one that I have to focus the most on, which is the role of the consumer. Consumers are way too disengaged in the purchase of health care today. The Affordable Care Act tried to address that in two fundamental ways. The first was by introducing market forces into the purchase of health insurance through exchanges, state exchanges that allow consumers to effectively price compare their insurance products. The second is in the news very much today, which is the, with the, the policy, with the economist's favorite policy, the Cadillac tax. Now, I'd lose my card-carrying economist talk, about my, my card is an economist, if I didn't spend a little bit of my five minutes talking about the Cadillac tax, because actually this is the economist's favorite part of the law. Because in America today, we have a situation where if you're paid in wages, you get taxed. And if you're paid in health insurance, you're not. So if MIT comes to me and says, John, would you like a $1,000 raise, or $1,000 in orthodontia benefits for your daughter, I say, well, $1,000 raise, I'm going to take home 600 bucks. $1,000 in orthodontia benefits, I get all the orthodontia benefits. I'm going to do that. So my daughter has these cool braces that spin and change colors and all that cool stuff. Because why not? They're free. Okay? Basically, we have set up a system which bribes people to buy excessively generous health insurance through their employer. The Cadillac tax is simply an attempt to offset that. 
It's not an attempt to tax people. It's an attempt to get rid of an excessive tax subsidy, which has been one of the major drivers of excessive health care spending in America. And it's going to play a critical role in doing so. And that's why getting rid of it is not just about replacing the $91 billion over the first decade in lost revenues. It's about it's the, the fundamental goal that's going to get consumers in the game of, of paying more attention to their health care costs and their insurance costs. That's the first thing Obamacare did. The second thing, which has also been discussed tonight, is change the way providers are reimbursed and organized through promoting ACOs, promoting bundled payments, things like that. So far, I sort of agree with John. The evidence, it, it's more at the sort of vocabulary stage than the evidentiary stage. Uh, it sounds good, but it hasn't really done a whole lot yet. But at least we're moving in that direction. The third is um, evidence-based medicine, which has also been mentioned. Uh, this is the hardest thing to do politically because you bring up the R word, rationing. So it's very hard to do evidence-based medicine politically. But what the Affordable Care Act did do was set, up, set aside $3 billion for the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, which does research on cost-effective care that hopefully someday politicians will have the stones to use to actually make policy. Right now it's just ephemeral research. Hopefully someday it can become policy and we can use it to make insurance coverage decisions. And then finally, one thing that has been talked about probably the least tonight, the fourth sort of leg of this chair, is wellness. We have to, we have to move forward on wellness. This is the place the Affordable Care Act probably did the least. Uh, we did some things like uh, uh, getting rid of co-payments for preventive screening and allowing employers to vary the amount that they charge their employees for participation in wellness activities, uh, charging smokers more for their health insurance for the first time in our nation's history. We pioneered that in Massachusetts, but it's now national. So we did some things to promote wellness, but a lot more needs to happen. Here, however, is the place where I'm least worried that the law didn't do much, because this is where I'm seeing actually the most private sector innovation. This is where we're really seeing exciting innovation, new technologies, wearable technologies, uh, big data processing, to really help people make their wellness decisions. And I think this is the place where uh, there's a lot of promise that the private sector might actually do uh, what we need to do. When you combine the ugly politics of the government trying to get involved in wellness with the promise of private sector investment in this sector, I think that that's really sort of uh, the most promising direction we can head. So anyway, I think the bottom line is I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in with the 10% of people who said, uh, no, we don't spend too much on healthcare. How much is enough? We honestly don't know. Uh, but the main thing I want to leave you with is two words you think about healthcare costs, which is to be humble and to be patient. Okay? To be humble in recognizing that right now that intersection between controlling costs and improving health is incredibly small, but it's growing. We're learning more every day, and that's why we need to be patient. We have, we have a long time to turn the ship around. We don't have to solve it tomorrow. Unfortunately, humble and patient are not two words you'd use to describe politicians. So we've got a political problem in dealing with that. But that's up to this expert community to really help convince the, the, the leaders that we need to take our time and get this right. Thank you very much.